Hey, it's Marie Forleo, and welcome to the Marie Forleo Podcast. I am so excited for today's conversation. Look, if you care about your health, your family's health, and you want to solve some of our biggest collective issues like inequality, injustice, and climate change, you have got to listen to this episode because I'm talking once again with my dear friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, and this time it's about his new book, which is spectacular and in my opinion, a must read. It's called Food Fix. Now, if you don't know Mark yet, let me tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Mark Hyman is a practicing family physician and an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine. He's the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the head of strategy and innovation of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and get this, a 12-time New York Times bestselling author. He's a board president for clinical affairs for the Institute of Functional Medicine as well. So he's also got an amazing podcast called The Doctor's Pharmacy, and Mark is a regular contributor to several television shows and networks, including CBS This Morning, Today, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. You name it. He's been all over the place. So let's dive into this conversation. Mark, you are amazing. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Well, it's a privilege and I love talking to you and you're the best. So like, it's a no brainer. (laughs) Well, let's talk about this big new book. I feel like in your heart and of course, what you've expressed as well in the book is that perhaps this is the most important one you've ever written. And for context, you've been a New York Times bestseller 12 times. So yeah, there's that. (laughs) Yeah, there's just that little thing. So tell us, what is the thesis behind Food Fix and why does this one in particular mean so much to you? Well, well, you know, Maria, I've been a doctor for 30 years now and sitting in my office seeing patients. And at some point, it feels like I'm just a guy with a big bucket bailing out a sinking ship because the flood of chronic disease just keeps growing and growing and growing obesity, diabetes. I mean, the the numbers are staggering. Six out of 10 Americans have a chronic disease. Four in 10 have more than one. And it's projected to be 83 million. We'll have more than three within 10 years. I mean, we are just getting sicker and fatter than ever. We went from 5% obesity to 40% now, 75% overweight. And I'm like, wait a minute, why are my patients so sick? And And I, and as a functional medicine doctor, I'm always asking why, 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 does my patient have this symptom? Why does, what's the root cause? And and I started thinking about, wait a minute, if I want to heal my patients, I can't really do it in my office. I can't do it in the clinic or the hospital. I have to do it where actually the problem is. And I realized it was the food they were eating that was making most of them so sick. And then it was like, well, what's the food caused by? It's caused by the food system. I'm like, what's the food system caused by? Well, it's caused by our food policy. What was that caused by? It's caused by the food industry influencing our government. So I realized that so many of um, the rabbit holes I went down were all connected that I had thought were separate. You know, yes, chronic disease and food for sure as a functional medicine doctor. But then I'm like, wait a minute, the economic burden of that is staggering. You know, right now, uh, by uh, one third of our Medicare is on chronic disease, sorry, one third of our entire federal budget is on chronic disease. Within five years, it's going to be about half of every dollar that's gathered by taxes from the government. It's a mandatory spending dollar, which is, will be for Medicaid and Medicare. That's like one out of every $2. It's staggering. It's, tr- it's part of our $22 trillion debt. And then I'm like, well, what else is going on with food? Well, it's the number one cause of climate change. It's destroying our pollinator species. It's, um, uh, leading to the destruction of soils and depletion of our fresh water. I'm like, what else? And I'm like, well, it's causing uh, all kinds of issues. Like mental illness is linked to food and, and the processed food we're eating. It's linked to achievement gaps where kids can't learn because they're, they're eating all this garbage. And why, it's why we're 31st in math and reading in the world and Vietnam is 21st. And it's even linked to things like violence and divisiveness in our society and, and, and crime and homicide through the way it affects the brain. Uh, and of course, that that's not only it. And then it affects national security, which means that we can't mount an army because our uh, effectively, because 70% of kids who apply for the military are rejected because they're unfit to fight. So I began to sort of link everything together, connect the dots. And like, there's a story here that no one's told about how food is both the cause of most of what's wrong with the world and also the cure. And that's the, the sort of happy side of this is that it's called food fix, not food apocalypse. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I have to say, too, when I started reading my galley copy, um, I was sitting in my bed 
uh, and I was reading it in Los Angeles and I just, I was like, whoa, like this is big, this is heavy. And like Jersey Marie came out. I got so angry. I'm like underlining stuff. I'm like yelling at Josh, like, can you believe this? I'm showing him the stats. Uh, I'll read this. Um, one of the things that you share in the beginning, our food chain is plagued with corruption from seed to field to fork to landfill. We have a moral, economic, medical, and environmental imperative to fix it. The very survival of our species depends on it. And I love that you shared this again, reading your own words. Our most powerful tool to reverse the global ec epidemic of chronic disease, heal the environment, reverse climate change and poverty and social injustice, reform politics and revive economies is food. And I think one of the things that struck me most um, when I was reading the book is all these dots that you're connecting, you know, for anyone who's been passionate about their health or looked at any of these other issues separately, whether it has been around chronic disease, uh, climate change, uh, inequality and injustice, you know, you might be familiar with some of these ideas, but to see how they all knit together with food yeah. is really a wake up call. So I'm wondering if we can talk next, because again, for anyone listening, if you've got kids around, now is probably the time to put on your headphones because there may be a possibility that you know, <laughs> Marie comes out. So look, I think all of us need to wake up and understand how utterly corrupt and frankly ass backwards our food system is right now. It feels like mm. a deadly joke. So let me read this one paragraph from your book. You write, we also have a co-opted government. When I asked Van Veneman, the former Secretary of Agriculture under George W. Bush, why we couldn't have science guide our food policies and agriculture, or why we don't stop the marketing of junk food to kids, or have more transparent food labels, or stop subsidies for commodities turned into processed food, or create subsidies for fruits and vegetables, she told me it was the food and agriculture's influence uh, on Congress and the administration, meaning those industries. Almost 73% of the members of the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, and 90% of the House Agriculture Committee received donations from Monsanto and Syngenta, which I don't even know who the hell Syngenta is, but it's they a, sound not a, so good. It's a seed company. There's like four seed companies that control 60% of the seeds uh, in the world, and uh, and they are just monstrous. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't realize this, but the food industry is the biggest industry on the planet. It's 17% of the world's economy. Uh, and it's it's run by a few dozen CEOs of big food companies, processed food companies, fast food companies, fertilizer companies, seed companies, and big ag companies. I mean, it's just it's just staggering. And I think the, the good news is we're seeing real change. Like Kellogg's last week, I think, announced that it was going to get glyphosate out of their supply chain. So no more Roundup in your Cheerios in the morning or your Yay! Frosted Flakes. I mean, Progress. They, I mean, there was, they, they were outed, but it was because people like you and I and others speak out and the average consumer says, we don't want this stuff in our food. That And they were outed by environmental working group saying, you know, you've got more glyphosate in Cheerios than you do have uh, vitamin D or vitamin B12. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. Yeah. And so uh, they they voluntarily changed it. General Mills committed a million acres to regenerative agriculture, which we'll talk about what that is. But that's a great thing, which is agriculture that, you know, restores the earth, restores soil, reverses climate change, makes healthier food. I mean, it's just it's fabulous. And yet um, this is all done because people are speaking out. People care. Consumers care. And the big companies yeah. are listening. Yeah. I'm going to just read a few more things because I would like my audience to get fired up. <laughs> Yeah. Because I think we can we can channel that being fired upness, that anger, that outrage into healthy activism and demanding change. So, guys, for those of us in America, in America, only two percent of our farmland is used to grow fruits and vegetables, despite despite the fact that our government says fifty percent of our diet should be fruits and vegetables. <laughs> we don't grow enough to even satisfy that minimum. And I thought, again, heartbreaking. Fifty nine percent are commodity crops, corn, wheat, and soy that gets turned into ultra processed food that essentially kills us and destroys the environment. Um, I'm wondering if you can share, Mark, what you said when you spoke at the 2013 World Economic Forum when everyone was talking about like how to reduce yeah. healthcare costs. <laughs> well, what did a, you come and say? <laughs> so first of all, I'm like this, you know, lowly family doctor, and I'm at this big meeting of all the big 
movers and shakers in healthcare, the head of pharma companies, the head of health insurance companies, the head of health systems, health ministers. I mean, you, you know, go- government, uh, you know, experts. Uh, we had, you know, deans of public health schools, and I'm, I'm, I'm this incredible panel of people up at the front t- telling how do we fix healthcare. And it was well, we're going to make things more efficient. We're going to reduce errors. We're going to coordinate care better. We're going to have better health technology and better payment systems. And I'm like, all that sounds great. But it's sort of like moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. How about we figure out why people are sick in the first place so they don't need the health care? And it might be because of what they're eating. And, and it was hysterical because the whole room went quiet. It was like I just literally announced the meaning of life. And <laughs> and, 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 and like afterwards, the, the dean came up to me, the dean of Columbia Public School of Health, who was moderating the panel. She says, Mark, that was such a great comment. We had never thought of that. And we we're all discussing this afterwards. And I'm like, Really? (laughs) Yeah, but hey, this is the benefit, right, of of having, you know, all of us, I think, can get so insular in our own industries. And, you know, we start like, okay, what do we work on? And it takes someone perhaps like you who hasn't been embedded in their particular worlds to just point out sometimes the obvious, which is, Mm -hmm. yeah, let's look at what the hell we're eating that's making us all sick in the first place. Yeah, and I, I think people just don't understand the level at which food plays a role in our health. I think people sort of, oh yeah, if you eat too much, you gain weight. It's like, all right, yeah, if you eat too much of this or that, it might not be good for you. But the scope in which it actually causes disease and the way in which it can cure disease is just so far beyond most doctors and the average person's understanding. I mean, the data came out last year that 11 million people die every year from eating processed, ultra, what we call ultra processed food, which comes from basically corn, wheat, and soy that's made into thousands of uh, it's food-like science projects that are industrial products that aren't really food, like Twinkies or whatever, Doritos. And and um, 11 million people die every year. I think that's an underestimate. That's the amount of people that died in the entire Holocaust in World War II. Um, it's a staggering amount. And, and yet no one really is talking about this. And no one is saying, wait a minute, let's let's look at this as a crisis. If, I mean, look, we're all scared about coronavirus. You know, it's killed a few hundred people. It's terrible, but it's not 11 million people. <laughs> Right? Yeah. I mean, the world's no. up in arms. We've got viruses. We've got tests. We've got this. Like, nobody's talking about this. And I'm- well, I think, yeah, we human beings, right, are generally terrible at understanding long-term consequences, like the things that we do every single day that over time destroy us, right? Mm. I think that's one of the one of the challenges, but I love that you're raising the alarm here. And I, I just want to say, too, in terms of most just everyday, regular, normal Americans, normal people around the world. We've got you know folks listening in from 195 countries that we just don't recognize how important this is. And I want to give two points, uh, personal points on this. One, several years ago, I almost lost my dad because he was his kidneys were failing. He passed out in a bank, cracked his head open on the marble floor. Uh, type two diabetes. You know, forget about it. He was just going in the wrong direction and everything in his body started to fail. And I had been trying to, you know, encourage the eating of the more green things called vegetables and all this stuff. But all of us, myself included, you only kind of wake up when you wake up. And I'll tell you now, my dad's in his mid seventies, completely cured of his type two diabetes. He's off practically, he used to be on, I think like 16 medications a day. I think he's on like maybe one tiny half of something. And he works out five days a week in the morning, plus an hour on his bike every day. He's like more fit than most people I know. His energy and stamina is just out of the roof. And I'll say this too, me, I know about a lot of this. You and I have talked, you're a dear friend. I pay attention to these things because I care about my health and my performance. I just had a series of tests done and I learned that I developed a gluten insensitivity, like out of, that came out of nowhere. And just for the past few weeks, I've, I've been like, okay, this is great. You know, I'm going to, I've been traveling a bit, so I have to go back and, you know, do a few more things to check out, make sure everything's cool. And I'm sure it is. But even me removing gluten from my diet these past few weeks, I had called my doctor because I was feeling like a little bit of brain fog that felt unusual to me. And also feeling um, in terms of my mood, my mood was off. And I'm like, this doesn't feel like me. And honestly, Mark, I thought it was maybe hormonal. And when I got all the tests on, it was like, oh, look at this, something I was eating. And I eat tons of organic food was causing me to kind of go. So anyway, I want to say that for everyone listening, even for people like, oh, you know, I, I shop all the right things. I eat all the right things. It's like no one is exempt from this. No one. 
No, it's true. And I think people don't connect how bad they feel with what they're eating. Because <laughs> yes. it's just this low level, oh, am I a little achy or am I congested or am I got a little aerial bowel, digestive issues? You know, maybe I like, I don't know, just, you know, have a little sinus problem or headaches yes. or whatever. And they don't connect the dots between what they're eating and how they feel. Yes. And I think, I think that is really the most powerful insight that people can get by doing like a quick reset. I, we created something called the 10-day detox, 10-day reset. People can go on and fi- figure it out. But it's super easy. It's free. And it's just a way for you, you know, everybody to have the insight that the reason they feel like crap is because of what they're eating. And eating, yes. Yeah. Y- yeah, it, it can't, you know, I, I was just in London speaking <laughs> to people about everything is figure outable in my book and we were talking about a bunch of things. And, you know, I was thinking to myself too, I'm like, I want to pull these people aside going, look, I can tell you all the things that you can do from a mindset perspective and from habits and perspectives, but we have to look at your biology and like what you're putting in your body and how that is impacting how you feel and how you think and your energy and all that. Anyway. Anyway, well, moving millions. on. Yeah, go for it. Well, it's important because I, I think, you know, people don't often understand why they feel bad. We see so much depression, anxiety, yes. panic attacks, you know, behavior problems in kids, violence, divisiveness in society. People don't get that that's connected to what we're eating. You know, I, I think you probably know David Perlmutter. He's a neurologist and he, he wrote a new book called Brainwash where he explained how our inflammatory diet of ultra processed foods decouples the adult in our brain from the reptile. In other words, the frontal lobe, which is our adult in the room that, you know, makes rational decisions, uh, make sure you don't do something terrible, is is what keeps us, you know, safe in a sense. Yes. And then the, 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 the reptile brain is just reactive and yelling and fighting and fleeing and it's sort of the, the lizard brain. And yet the lizard brain is taking over, which is why we see all this violence and, and hatred and, and, and divisiveness, whether it's the diet wars or whether it's the Republicans, Democrats, it's all so divided. And, and the reason is that that partly, I think, is because we are in a culture that serves food that makes our brains not work properly. A hundred percent. I mean, again, my own personal experience of this, of just like dipping my toe in and seeing the difference of how I feel on a daily basis based on what I eat, how I'm thinking, how I'm reacting, you know, all of it, it is absolutely interlinked. And in fact, this is a great bridge. I want to talk about how big food companies are targeting certain communities, kids, teenagers, poor people, black and brown people, both here and around the world. So before we dive in, I want to—I have a few bullet points here. Again, all this pulled out of your book. Um, every year, Coke and McDonald's spends $1.8 billion marketing their products to kids as young as two years old. That's criminal. From 2013 to 2017, food advertising on black targeted TV increased by 50%. Black teens viewed 119% more junk food related ads, mostly for soda than white teens. And as you uh, explained a little earlier why this matters, all of our kids' future is threatened by the achievement gap caused in large part by their inability to learn on a diet of fast food and sugar. This, These two next points, Mark, I'm telling you, this is where Jersey Marie got so fired up and I'm thinking like, <laughs> how do I use you know, my marketing smarts to like tackle this? That's where my brain was going. So the president of Coca-Cola International, Ahmet Bozar, said this to a group of investors in 2014. There's yeah. 600 million teenagers who have not had a Coke in the last week. So the opportunity for that is huge. And yeah. obviously the data shows us that soda kills. And then this last one, I'm like, here's, here's basically my response a bit right after what I'm about to read. Well, I'll read it first and I'll tell you. Nestle recruits thousands of women in some of the poorest towns in Brazil to go door to door selling candies and processed food as part of mm. its goal to expand its global reach to a quarter million Brazilian households. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this, you know, one of the things I'm shocked by, Mark, when I travel around is how many different people listen to my show. And I'm often sometimes surprised, you know, pundits and people that I admire, you know, they're like, oh my God, I'm a fan. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So if anyone right now works for Nestle or Coke or is connected to them, y'all, you need to get your shit together because I feel like (laughs) what they're doing is selling poison for profit. This is not okay. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> you know, here's the problem is, is, is we, we basically have a food system that was created out of good intentions that's had incredibly bad consequences. So yes, during, you know, the period of industrialization after World War II, we started using fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides and industrial farming methods and factory farming of animals. And it was thought to be a good thing because it was going to provide more food for more people, produce lots of extra starchy calories, which we all thought were needed. And it, and it was very successful at that. 
but no one really understood the unintended consequences of, you know, when we made Crisco and trans fats or when we made high fructose corn syrup. And it was an attempt to try to do something good, but it turned very bad. And now these companies are stuck in a legacy of products and businesses that need to adapt to a future that is going to be very different. Because if we don't, we're going to have no food. I mean, we're going to have no water. We're going to have no pollinators. We're going to have, you know, massive levels of chronic disease and of course, you know, rapid climate change. So I, th I think we, these companies are starting to get it and they're adapting their products They're taking up bad ingredients or formulating, reformulating products or they're buying up all the health food companies or investing in, in regenerative agriculture and sustainability issues. I mean, it's just, it's interesting to see that this is shift happening in the last couple of years. Cause thank I mean, God you, you just pulled me back from the edge. Cause I was like yeah. getting all mad at them. So, I mean, but, well, but I mean, you, <laughs> yeah. I mean it's, it's like, it's, you know, so, and I, and it was interesting. It's, e it's easy to be, you know, they're evil out there and we're the good guys here. But, uh, you know, I, over the years, I've gotten to meet a lot of these people, top executives at Pepsi and uh, Nestle and, and Danone and, you know, these companies where there's a real, uh, there's a real interest in trying to figure this out and getting good. that they're, they're killing their customers and that they're actually by the very methods of farming that are being used to produce their products, they're, they're affecting their future success and, and their ability to grow because, you know, it's just not sustainable. So I, I see there's a movement. It's not fast enough. They still are doing bad things. So it's like left hand, right hand kind of thing while they, you know, while they're saying we want to do the right thing. Some of them are, you know, doing very subversive tactics to, you know, drive policy changes in their interests, like preemptive taxes, where they're, you know, forcing through various kinds of manipulation, bribery and influence uh, governors to pass laws that preempt any future taxes on soda or junk food. So it, it's it's not 100 percent clean. And there's still yeah. there's still some bad acting in there. But I think things are shifting in the right direction. And the, well, that's the, good. The marketing thing, though, is huge. I mean, we, you know, we have the First Amendment in this country, which is a great thing, but it, it should not uh, allow us to, um, to to target children in ways that are are manipulative, that are subversive, that are, uh, you know, predatory. Uh, it's predatory. Pre pre predatory. In nature. Yeah. I mean, the yes. guy, this guy, uh, Guardo Jardi, uh, from who's a vice president of the Senate in Chile, uh, and, and was able to introduce a whole set of legislation in Chile with the Michelle Bachelet, who was the president, they were both doctors, which I think is why this has happened because they could, they knew what was going on. Uh, and the, and they basically, you know, did all this great stuff like getting rid of marketing to kids and it showed a fourfold reduction in consumption compared to soda taxes. They, they got rid of, uh, cartoon characters on, on cereal boxes. They put warning labels. All that was great. And the guy said that he thinks that, you know, 21st century, I mean, the food companies are the 21st century pedophiles. Now that's a strong statement. I'm not trying to agree, but I think it just speaks to the ways in which these kids are being targeted. And now it's not so bad. It's not um, so obvious, right? So if, if you see an ad and a cartoon character, Ronald McDonald on TV on a Saturday morning, everybody knows what's going on. Now there's 5.4 billion ads just alone in one year on Facebook by the food companies. There's millions and millions and hundreds of millions of ads on on social media and other things that are sort of stealth. It's called stealth marketing. Uh, they have advert games where they literally create fun games for kids online that are on social media that are quote free, but are embedded with McDonald's and Oreo cookies and Wendy's Jeez. and whatever. So it's, it's, it's really, and it's unfairly targeting them. And they, they actually are not just so benign. They're actually imaging these kids' brains. So they literally put kids in an MRI machine. They can look at the blood flow and they can see if the imaging they use in their advertising activates the, you know, emotional response they want. So the kid will want to get it. I mean, kids at two years old can name brand name products. So they probably can't even name a vegetable, you know, like. <laughs> okay. So I'm back on my Jersey Marie kick. Okay. We got it. We, got <laughs> we do like, we can absolutely applaud and celebrate moves in the right direction. And we can say it's not enough. And there are certain things that need to end. I'm going to keep going. I want to talk about um, the loss of biodiversity in agriculture mm, systems and specifically mm. one of my favorite parts of the book, something I've been fascinated by um, recently and learning more and more about is um, regenerative practices and the difference between dirt and soil. Can you speak yeah. to that? Okay. Well, this is, this is fairly, you know, new field. So we've heard about organic, we've heard about our sustainable uh, and, and what's really happening at a high level in our agricultural system is we're farming in ways that destroy the soil, right? We've, we've, we've lost a third of all our topsoil in the last 150 years. We're projected to lose all of it within 60 harvests. And it's important because when you have soil, 
it's rich in organic matter and carbon, and it basically sucks carbon out of the atmosphere. It can hold more than the, all the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere today. It conserves water. So you literally can hold for every 1% organic matter in the soil, you can hold 25,000 gallons of water and you can have six, 8% organic matter, which will prevent droughts and floods and create resilience to weather. And it also increases the ecosystem diversity. So you get more pollinators and insects and good plants and, uh, and it creates a whole healthy ecosystem for the farmer where he makes better food, makes more money, it's more climate and weather resistant. He, uh, you know, builds soil, actually doesn't use chemical inputs, conserves water, and makes 20 times the amount of money as his neighbor. So it's a win-win all around. And I think people are beginning to understand that this form of agriculture is far better and is actually necessary compared to what we have now, which is destructive and extractive agriculture, where you till the soil and you, you just leave bare soil and use chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides. So this whole movement toward regenerative agriculture is, I think, is one of the most critical things that's going on now, because if we start at the farm, we create better food, we reverse climate change, we create better working conditions for farmers, better conditions for the animals because we're out there grazing. Uh, and people think, oh, I have to become vegan in order to save the planet. And that's certainly the message out there. But when you dig down deeper, actually, uh, the, the best way to restore the climate and the best way to actually build soil is integrating animals into a regenerative farm. You don't have to eat them, but they, you know, you still have to do that. And you actually build more life. You create more ha wild habitat for, for the natural animals in that habitat. Whereas, yes. for example, if you're, if you're having these big organic vegetable farms uh, that are massive and are not done in a regenerative way, you literally are killing tons of animals. There's a study came out that you literally, if you're, if you're eating only like vegetables and, and, and beans and grains and so forth, you're literally killing 7 billion animals a year through conventional agriculture. <laughs> whereas, whereas, you know, we, we kill about 21, 9 million cows, which is a lot in this country, but 7 billion. So you're not, you know, even if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you're still in the cycle, or as I said in Lion King, the circle of life. <laughs> and, uh, and this is, a, and regenerative agriculture is a much better way to actually, um, you know, do all the things we want to do, which is create better food that's better for people, that reverses disease, that reverses climate change. It really is fascinating, and it feels like the way of the future, and it gave me such um, a feeling of hope and a feeling of returning us to more connection um, with each other and with nature and with everything that's alive. It's true, and it's scalable. People say, oh, it's sort of elitist and nobody can do it, but the truth is it, it is scalable. The UN said uh, recently that if we took $300 billion, which is basically the military spend of the entire world for 60 days, so two months of spending on war, and we invested it to help convert the 2 million of the 5 million hectares of degraded land around the world to regenerative agriculture, we could mm -hmm. stop climate change for 20 years. We literally could just what? pause. Yeah. And, oh. and it's, you know, $300 billion, that's less than Medicare spends on diabetes in this country, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's, it's a solvable problem and, and it's scalable. And we have so much degraded land in the United States we can, we can convert land that, that's not usable for other things, uh, like growing vegetables or crops, to using animals to incorporate into the uh, ecosystem that actually builds soil. I mean, that's how we got 50 to 80 feet of topsoil in America, was we had 60, 80 million ruminants like bison and elk running around America and building all this soil. They dig and eat and poop and pee, and, eat, and the saliva would make the plants grow, and they, would, they wouldn't graze it down to the stubble. They would graze enough and then move on to the next fresh patch. And it was such a win-win for everything. So they weren't causing climate change. It's not, it's, it's not the a animals. It's how they are, are raised. And uh, Russ Conzer, who's a, a, a regenerative farmer, said, you know, it's not the cow, it's the how. And, mm. and I think people think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to switch to plant-based meats. That's better. Yes, it's much better for the environment than eating conventional factory farming. But when you compare it in a life cycle analysis to, for example, the Impossible Burger, because it's GMO soy and it's, the soy is grown in conventional ways. It degrades soil and all the things we talked about and the herbicides compared to a regeneratively raised beef burger. You actually add three and a half kilos of carbon for an impossible burger and you take out three and a half kilo of carbon for a regenerative burger. So you literally have to eat one regeneratively raised grass fed burger to offset the carbon emissions of an impossible burger. <laughs> so I, 
And this is why your book is so important for people to read, like to understand and to look at the science and to kind of open all of our eyes to solutions that are out there that just feel right. And I think that's one of the most striking things about, um, for me, reading your book, it was like so much of this is common sense, yet none of it is common practice yet. You know, there are people, of course, doing such great work and we're getting there, but I'm excited for for everyone listening to, to get your book and to read it and hopefully raise their voices because it's necessary. And I mean, just looking at climate in and of itself, if you kind of extract and just zoom in on that issue, again, everything else is so important, but pretty soon we're not going to have a planet to live on, <laughs> right? If yeah. we don't handle it. Um, I want to keep moving though, because for folks listening and thinking about Maybe they miss our earlier episodes. I think we should talk about how anyone can eat healthier no matter what their budget for groceries. So um, for anyone listening who's thinking about, okay, well, what about my health? Like I might have some brain fog. I might, you know, have those bloated feelings or just, gosh, irritable bowel syndrome or just things happening that you kind of assume is, oh, this is my human body. Well, maybe not. Um, what do we start with? How can you give us some some tips about where to get started no matter where we live or how much we can spend? Absolutely. You know, so in the book, I really it's a it's a big ask I'm making to think about the whole system but I have a whole action guide where where the average person can do a lot and there's so it's, it's so much that we can do to, to change our footprint on the planet to improve our health and and the first thing is just think about when you're eating how do you eat for the health of humans in the planet right it, it, it's sort of a it, it's sort of a different little little framework on it. it's just not about you anymore it's about the bigger context so I, I jokingly create something called the peak and diet, which essentially is, you know, combining, you know, whole foods and getting rid of all the diet wars and you know, eating a lot, lot of plant rich foods, you know, low starch and sugar, lots of good fats, lots of nuts and seeds. You know, if you're eating animals, make sure they're regeneratively raised uh, if you can. Uh, whole grains and beans, not the flowers, you know, get rid of sugary beverages, really simple things that I outline in the book about how to do this. Uh, mm-hmm. and, I've, and I've written like cookbooks. My last one was food. What the heck should I cook? And you know, it's great. I mean, you can make such delicious food. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, think about ways to drive the marketplace with your choices. So, you know, do we know GMO is bad for us? I don't know. Like we can argue that all day long. We do know that what they put on GMO is bad for us, the pesticides and the herbicides. There's no question about that. So don't buy GMO foods. And and there are a lot of companies now that are putting non-GMO labels on. So you actually know that they don't have GMO as opposed to the opposite, which is what we should have, which is putting a label on that it does have GMO, but that sends a big message. It changes the supply chain. It makes people buy different things and companies produce different things. Uh, Campbell's soup got rid of all GMO in their food. I mean, uh, it's not that Campbell's soup is great, but you know, um, yeah. and, and then there's things you can do simply like food waste. We didn't talk about that, but we waste 40% of our food on the planet. That's enough. Um, that would be have to grow on the entire landmass of China. It's a waste of $2.6 trillion a year. It would feed 10.5 billion people. And all we have to do is imagine going home and throwing 40% of our food out from the grocery store. That's pretty much what we do in America. So you can have a compost pile, take your food scraps and make a little compost pile. You can have urban composting machines that you can use in your apartment if you live in an apartment. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, when you do that, you're helping to reverse climate change because if, if it, because of the, when the food goes to the landfill, it releases methane, which is 25 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And if it were a country, food waste would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the US and China. And it's a fixable wow. problem. So really, and, and of course, people want to become politically active, they can do that. I think there's, there's a, you know, a little bit of a, a sense of uh, defeatism there, but it matters, you know, you turn up the heat on the politicians, you can go to foodpolicyaction.org, they have a list of your congressmen and senators, what they vote on in the food nag issues. Uh, people have been outed from Congress because of that group that's actually created social media campaigns. Um, there, maybe you want to advocate for a municipal composting ordinance in your town, or maybe you want to work with your schools to help improve school lunches, like many examples I give in there. And, uh, and people can even get more serious about it by taking their money and only investing in businesses that are uh, doing the right thing. Um, recently, there's a, a giant, like, uh, I think it's one of the biggest uh, investment for the blank, uh, was it Blackstone or Blackstone, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. uh, they literally have trillions in assets. And they the, 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 the head of that uh, uh, fund said, we're going to not invest in any companies that aren't helping to protect against climate change or that are not causing climate change. So, you know, they're not going to invest in fossil fuels. They're not going to invest in, in, in factory farming of animals. They're not going to do all those things, which is huge. And money speaks. And so 
That's you know, right. <clears throat> there's, there's a company called goodmoney.com. I think a friend of ours, Gunnar, runs it. Yes. And, and it's essentially the idea is that you can choose where your money's going. So like my daughter's like, oh, I don't want to be invested in TD Bank because they fund uh, they fund the Dakota Pipeline. So, <laughs> you know, and they were doing all this. And I'm like, wow, that's an incredible way of thinking about how you can be empowered about what to do. I love it. And so for people listening right now, too, who might be on their own health journey, and I think that there is a significant portion of uh, our listening population who might be there right now, working their best, right, getting as many veggies as they possibly can, looking to take care of their health. I'm curious if you can also tell us about the story of Janice and Mm -hmm. what is possible, because I think, you know, for some people, and you mentioned this feeling defeatist, especially around our politics, um, you know, here in the States. And I think it's true in other parts of the world as well. You know, part of that is like, oh, nothing I do makes a difference could be tied back to your health. Then I know Janice, who was dancing with death at like 66 years old, right? She was severely obese, suffering from heart failure, type two diabetes, coronary art disease. What happened when she really woke up and understood that a food fix was possible for her? Well, you know, Janice uh, was like many Americans who grew up eating junk food. She was actually fairly educated, but her family never really had a food culture. Everything was processed, packaged in a box or can. And she just ate that way her whole life. And by the time she was 66, she was 243 pounds with a body mass index of 43. Normal is like 25 or less. She had type 2 diabetes. Her blood sugars were out of control on tons of insulin. She had heart failure. She had kidney failure. She had fatty liver, and she had high blood pressure. Was on a pile of drugs, and she literally was was about on her to go out. You know, she really wasn't going to last much longer. Um, and she came to our program at Cleveland Clinic called Functioning for Life, which is a group program where people do stuff together, and it's always better to do stuff. And that's why you know your work is so great because you get people together on programs and approaches that really help motivate them. And she, within three days of changing her diet, it's essentially what I talked about in, in the Food Fix book, uh, the 10-day reset. She got off insulin in three days. In three months, she normalized her blood sugars, her heart failure reversed, her kidneys got better, her fatty liver got better, her blood pressure normalized, and she got off most of her medications and lost 43 pounds, and she kept going. And after a year, she lost 116 pounds and is a completely different person. Uh, and it's just striking to see how powerful food is. Because we think, oh, well, food is good as prevention. If I eat healthy, I won't get sick in the future. Actually, that's true. But it's also true that food is probably the most powerful drug on the planet to reverse most chronic disease if you know how to use it. And that's what was so inspiring to me about Janice. It's like he was someone at 66 who's really about to check out. And and look at what happened to them just very, very quickly by changing yeah. their diet and and actually following these principles of food as medicine and choosing the right stuff. And it's available well, to everybody. It's available to, well, yes. And, and you know, we won't go back because we won't go tread over uh, material that we did before. But uh, hopefully when people read Food Fix and understand just how the systems are preventing so many people from having easier access to those things, you know what I mean? Um, individually and collectively, we all got a lot of food fixes to make. Mark, I adore you. Is there anything else besides getting the book, which of course I recommend everyone do and share with their family, anywhere else you want them to go and check out if they are passionate about this topic? Absolutely. So, you know, created a a website called foodfixbook.com. And there's a lot of great free resources on there, including my video, five steps to a healthier and healthier planet. And also, um, our, our action guide, which gives actions for you, for policies that need to change that you can be vocal about, and business innovations that can happen. And 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 then there's there's a whole a bunch of wonderful bonuses if people get the book. So they can just go to foodfixbook.com. I'm also creating a campaign, which is a nonprofit and an advocacy group, because you know, I was with Sam Cass the other day, who was the senior policy guy in the White House under Obama for food. And uh, he said, you know, everybody came from the industry with all these regulations and laws and legislation written and policies and these briefing books, and they would give them to the lawmakers. But nobody came for the good guys. Nobody came for advocating for what we really need to do. And I, so that's really where I, I, you know, I'm working now is to really build a grassroots movement and an advocacy campaign to change these policies that are driving some of us of wrong. So how do we support regenerative agriculture? How do we, you know, deal with the food marketing issues for kids? How do we deal with you know, producing better quality food? How do we subsidize the right stuff? So I'm really excited about it. And it's going to, it's, it's probably going to be foodfix.org is the URL when it comes out, but stay yeah. tuned. You're going to hear more about that. Um, this is not a book, it's a movement and uh, hope you all join. 
Yeah, you're awesome. Well, I'll just say this. I'll say it publicly. I've been thinking as, you know, as time goes on, I'm like, I keep wanting to use my very genius marketing skills because I'm really good at what I do, you know, to continue to create good in this world. So consider me a pal and a friend because I feel like we can do some really fun campaigns because, you know, I think marketing on the right side of um, the change we want to see can really be some of that that support too. So thank you for the work that you do in this world. You are amazing. I have so many dear personal friends who are like, oh my God, you're friends with Mark. He's the best. <laughs> so, so we love you. I have you. the same Keep- comment. You're friends with oh. Marie. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a love fest. So we adore you. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for being a champion for what we all need, which is greater health and a more peaceful, just, and equitable world. So thanks for coming on today. Thank you, Marie. Oh my goodness. Was that not an incredible conversation or what? So we talked about a lot of things. Mark and I, of course, would love to hear from you. What is the biggest insight or takeaway that you've gotten from this conversation? And most important, how can you turn that insight into action? What steps are you going to take for your own food fix starting now? Again, I do highly recommend the book. Now, as always, the best conversations happen over at the magical land of marieforleo.com. So go there and leave a comment now. And if you're not yet subscribed to our email list, what's going on? You should be. I send the most amazing emails usually once a week. So go over there, hop on the email list. You'll get some exclusive content, special giveaways, and some personal updates that I just don't share anywhere else. Stay on your game and keep going for your dreams because the world really does need that very special gift that only you have. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Marie Forleo podcast, and I'll catch you next time. Hey, you having trouble bringing your dreams to life? Well, guess what? The problem isn't you. It's not that you're not hardworking or intelligent or deserving. It's that you haven't yet installed the one key belief that will change it all. Everything is figureoutable. It's my new book, and you can order it now at everythingisfigureoutable.com.